Welcome back to the Becoming Mama podcast. It is Sam here with a little announcement. This December, I am hosting a free event called Mom This, where the goal is to help you fill your cup a little bit this holiday season. Over 25 days, we're gonna be doing 12 simple but doable self-care tasks, things that are gonna make an impact and make you feel a little bit happier. They are all done on your own time. And alongside this, I have collaborated with some wonderful women-owned businesses to do five giveaways one every week over on Instagram. These are all mom-centered gifts and things that are custom and unique and things I think you will really love. I believe that we deserve to enjoy this season too. So if you're interested, go to welcome-mama.com and check it out there and be sure to invite your friends. You can also learn more at Instagram at Sam Thompson Hall. All those links are down in the show notes. That's it for me. And let's jump into today's episode on raising spirited children. Welcome back to the Becoming Mama podcast, where two long-lost best friends discuss all things motherhood. I'm Sam, and I'm here with my long-lost best friend, Emmy. Hello. I'm excited to be here. This is going to be an interesting podcast today. Yes. Emmy, why don't you tell us what we're going to be talking about today? We are going to be talking about spirited children, and by that, if you live in a home with a child that triggers you constantly. It's a unique experience uh, that some of us are blessed to have. Uh, But there's a lot you can learn from it, and there's a lot you can implement to help the situation. There's a lot you can work on. So I think it's going to be a really, really interesting conversation today. I'm very excited to learn about this. My son is, you know, only two and a half. Knows how to push my buttons, but we're not quite there yet. So hopefully this will give me some ammo for when that does happen. Uh, But before we jump into it, um, we're going to do our wins and losses. And we also wanted to thank you guys for the reviews on 13 five star reviews on Apple Podcasts. Holy smokes. Thank you so much. I can almost cry. Yes, this has been such a fun experience. And um, we we talked about a lot, but it's just brought us back together. And we can't, uh, we just had a whole conversation about how we're so grateful to have each other as friends again. So thank you for enjoying this experience as we enjoyed this experience. Uh, but let's go into our wins and losses. This has been a really uh, tumultuous week for me. So I'm going to let you go first. I mean, what was your win or loss of this week? All right. I think I'll be able to keep it pretty short this week. We have our first family Christmas coming up this weekend. I'm super, super excited about it. This is like the extended family on my mom's side. So it's going to be fun to get together with my sister, my grandma, snuggle up um, at our favorite house in the world on the family farm and mm-hmm. enjoy a few days together. So it's going to be the best. That's going to be so uh, fun. Yes, it will. Loss, not so good things. The weather has changed. It is cold. And I just want to like see if anybody else, maybe you can let us know, thinks humans are supposed to hibernate in the winter. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I just want to fire up the Netflix, turn on the fireplace, rest, and also I want to say the the thing that mirrors that is that I'm really struggling with having fit so many tasks into short periods of time. Like, I think that's something that a lot of people can probably resonate with. Last Mm -hmm. night we had a busy night, so I had to do, like, 20 tasks in a single hour, and I'm like... This is so hard to sustain, but you really have no other choice. So that's my, my yeah. thing for this week. I feel you in that. I definitely feel you in that. I, uh, I'll say that's my loss this week is I had a really stressful day yesterday. Tuesdays and Fridays, I have Teddy home with me right now. And they're mommy Teddy days. They're really special to me and to him. He loves them. And I had some work stuff come up and it made me really distracted for most of the day. And I was not the mom that I want to be. And it, it's weighed really heavily on me at the end of the day. Like all of the work stuff that happened, a project that I've been working on for a long time hit kind of a roadblock and that was hard. But what was harder was knowing how it impacted my mothering. And uh, that's my most sacred value. And it has made me really reflect today on, okay, like if you're going to do these things, you have to figure out how to not let them derail your motherhood experience as well. So that was just a little tough, but hopefully I can learn from it. And then my win though was last night was Teddy's first time trick-or-treating. He, yeah, it was, he was still COVID when he was like six months old. So we're like, ah, it's not really worth it. And then last year he had strep. And so this year was his first time getting to go out and he 
requested daddy to take him, which kind of broke my heart. But then also I love that he loves his dad. And so I was like, okay. So I I got home to hand out candy. And then I was like, I can't do it. And I just left the basket. I'm so <laughs> glad to hear there. that. I ran down the street and I was like, and as I'm running, Teddy goes, mommy, they're Teddy. And I, it was just awesome. He had so much fun and he went with all of our neighborhood friends. So it was a huge win. It was a really good ending to a really bad day. That's awesome. I'm so glad to yeah. hear that. Trick-or-treating was fun. I, I yeah. love it. I think it's the best. It really is. The, 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 it's like that Christmas joy, you know? Yeah, it's so exactly. Fun. They're so excited. Yeah. They run all over the place. It's a great time. Okay, what's your other win? Okay, perfect. Yeah, I win. feel like yeah. you're the the you shared the challenging day and not being the mom that you wanted to be on that given the circumstances that you had sort of weaves into our conversation today because parenting a spirited child or a child who struggles with behavior at times is a lot harder on days when you yourself not put together or you have been dealt challenging circumstances yourself it adds to that whole compounded stress piece that makes things really tricky so that will be one aspect of our conversation today but all right should i take it away should we dive in let's do it okay the first thing i thought i would share is just a, a legit definition of what a spirited child is according to our good friend google which brings up a really funny little sidebar that i shouldn't go into but last night fox was asked a question by a friend a neighbor friend and he was like well according to an alexa answer contributor <laughs> and i was like good job giving credit where credit's due <laughs> no plagiarism no plagiarism for this kid okay how to identify a spirited child they like to perform they may be charming among their peers they may be recognized as a charismatic leader they may also seem hungry for attention and love being the center of attention. They also may feed on external stimulation, including needing feedback from others. So if you're listening to that and you're like, oh, I have a child like that in my life, then you kind of know what we're talking about. But also, um, I am a school psychologist by profession and I have a background in mental health and I have worked with these kids throughout my professional career. And actually, one of my main roles in that job was writing behavior intervention plans for kids who experience difficult behavior in the school setting. And so a lot of the things that we talk about actually apply to all kids. I mean, any kid who's having a bad day or struggles with a certain um, expectation or, you know, something like that in their life. So hopefully, even if you don't have a child like this in your life, middle child, maybe not for you. Oh, John, um, I know you listen, you- John. My brother no, I can probably relate. And so that was actually what I was going to ask you is, do you feel like you know any of these people in your life or had any in your family? And you don't have to call them out, but you already did. So yeah, Johnner, my, my <laughs> brother Johnner, um, but he, he was never like a, a button pusher, attention seeker. He was just class clown, still is like he pranks us all all the time. I don't know when to believe him or not, um, but he's I would say he's spirited. And then um, I do know some kids and I have definitely, I used to be an elementary school teacher and middle school teacher. And I know these kids. Um, I thought that it was really interesting how you said they seek that external feedback. Um, and that I think is, I mean, you're probably going to go into it, but I can see that with like the button pushing and the pushing the boundaries constantly. If like, I just need you to, I need something from you. And whether that's yelling, whether that's snapping, whether at least I got that from you. And um, I've definitely experienced that. Yeah, definitely. Those kids who kind of need that constant input in order Mm -hmm. to feel secure and grounded in their space, I guess you'd say. Yeah. I I also would uh, consider John charismatic as well on that list. Oh, oh, both my brothers. Super charismatic. Very much envy them and their ability to talk to a brick wall and make the brick wall fall in love with them. (laughs) I have a cousin who I would not consider a spirited child, but I'm an adult now anyway, <laughs> but also charismatic in that same way. And I also envy that ability so much. And I was like, if I could just get an ounce of that, that'd be great. Yeah. yeah. I've shared a lot already, um, but I will into a little bit my experience parenting a spirited child because I'm, I'm going to try to not say who they are. And if you know me well and you know our family, then you already know who they are. But I 
I don't want this podcast to necessarily call out the person who this is in our family. Mm -hmm. Um, But I will say she, because I can't help myself. We love her very much, no matter how she acts or what she struggles with or what she needs. But it has been quite a journey for me learning to use the strategies and skills that I learned in my profession to support her in our home setting. And so it took a while. I mean, as a baby, I would say she didn't display necessarily many of these like the the of a spirited person that are more challenging. She was an easy baby. Um, But as those toddler years set in, it kept feeling like this is a phase. This is a phase. And it just became this is her personality. This is the way that she is. And realizing that we were going to have to learn how to support her with the the beautiful personality that she has, um, because this probably wasn't going to change anytime soon. Maturity has helped, and there are big shifts that get made for her. And we're like, oh, this thing that was a huge problem is no longer such an issue. One issue used to be that she would, just to give some examples here, like mm-hmm. really yell at us, um, become very angry at the drop of a hat. A lot of those things have gotten a lot better. Now we deal more with the crying and the whining about many, many things, most transitions, anything that's just not like perfectly in alignment with how she envisions things should be. She is a planner. Mm-hmm. She she schedules. And so anything like that, and I kind of I kind of resonate with this as a kid. I was the same way. And as an adult, I'm probably even more like this. I have a vision for how things are going to look and I want it to go that way. Um, but she has less flexibility within that framework than most kids probably do. And so that can be a challenge. And for me, it, it became, okay, I am freaking out on her, losing it way, way when I want to. This is something where I'm yelling every morning before school, getting dressed is hard every single morning getting in the van is hard every single morning. And what are we going to do? How are we going to sustain this long term? So the first thing that I did was start listening to more podcasts about, um, you know, this topic and figuring out how to manage my own energy and not let our energies intersect. So if she has a big ball of fiery energy around her, I don't necessarily let that invade my bubble. Like I create a metaphorical wall between, you know, I can stay on my ground, even though she's having a hard time. Mm -hmm. Also just walking away, that kind of thing helps. But I realized it was a lot deeper than that. I realized the triggers that I was experiencing were not going away. And so at that point, signed up for therapy with BetterHelp. It's like a online therapy platform. I've been to therapy a few times in my life. I recognized that this was something I really needed and sat down with an amazing, amazing therapist on there and was just like, yeah, having such a hard time with my daughter's behavior right now. And I don't want her to look back on this time and be like, oh, like this caused a real riff in my relationship with my mom. Like we have struggled and we've never recovered from this. I wanted to parent her the best that I could with and and develop the skills that I needed to do that. Yeah. Uh, So the therapy really helped. I would say, I think I was in therapy for four months. um, But after even just a couple of weeks, things started to get way better. And that was because I implemented a lot of new skills that really helped me. So one, one skill that helped right off the bat was when she would become really, really frustrated, I would just kind of imagine like picking up the warm clothes out of the dryer and hold Mm -hmm. that vision until you know, in order to, to man my own emotions and not let them rise Mm. with her. Mm. Um, and then we also started implementing a lot more tools. So using, um, behavior charts, she responds really, really well to those Mm. using, um, like more preventative type things. So planning things, having conversations with her, letting her know how the whole day is going to go. Um, I think even the, Whenever you can lean on prevention instead yeah. of those consequences, you're going to have so much more success. And maybe, mm-hmm. I don't know if any examples come up for you from in the schools of uh, working with kids where you found success or, or strategies that were really helpful. 
Yeah, not so much in schools, but definitely with Teddy, um, we use... And then five minutes comes, they're like, it's not five minutes yet. It's like, you yes. push the button. Yeah, you push the button, like, you know. And he really has very rarely fought back on that. Um, and same thing if, like, we are going to have a day that's different, we talk about it for days or weeks ahead <laughs> of time. Like, grandma's going to come spend time with you. Grandma's going to come. So when that time comes, it's like not a surprise that grandma is here. Are they snoring? Can you hear that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, those preventative measures have been really helpful. Yeah, we use timers a lot too, warnings, mm -hmm. conversations. And then on the consequence end, we do at times, um, just as a family, this is a personal preference, you know, uh, some technology gets taken away if if uh, expectations are not followed, but we always make sure that those expectations are very clear. We set, mm -hmm. you know, good limits, good boundaries, and we try to parent very respectfully and communicate as often as we can just some of the strategies that we used use on a daily basis. Um, we also are very, very committed to no violence within our parenting dynamic and within, you know, our home. We firmly believe that violence just breeds more violence. So we learn to problem use our problems, solve our problems using our words and not our hands. And I think that, and I know this for a fact, um, towards children who are spirited and have challenging behaviors exacerbates the problem. I know this from working in the schools. It makes kids want to be more sneaky, hide things more often. It almost never helps. Um, I yeah, be hard pressed to find a situation where it actually solved the root of the problem. Um, so there's a very, very hills I'm willing to die on, but that's one. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So just to continue down my list here, the ways that parenting a child that uh, struggles more has changed me are a lot. And I have had to, and I guess to kind of get into some advice pieces or some insights that I have gained from all of this, I have learned that in most situations, I need to look at whether the problem is actually them or it's the circumstances that have been set up. And so could we have been more preventative? Is their personality just not meshing with the way things are right now? So one example would be getting ready for school in the morning. That was really, really for us for a really long time. Um, but what, what I realized is that she's just a person who needs a plan, who needs plenty of time, needs to pick out her clothes beforehand. Um, and that can help struggle in the morning? Or is there some way we could set up our environment to make their life a little bit easier and more seamless during that time? That's that's the tricky time of day. I also think, like I mentioned with therapy, working on yourself first can be really, really essential. If you are constantly triggered by your child thinking about, is it really a them problem? Or is there something I can be doing uh, myself that's maybe going to make this a little bit easier. I think that Dr. Becky, do you know her? She has TED Talks. She has um, all kinds of amazing resources and workshops out there to help yeah. with parenting. Yeah. I would I highly recommend looking her up if you're in this situation. She has like a whole Instagram channel just full of tips that are literally helpful and like targeted to any given moment where you might be struggling in a parenting scenario. Her resources have been so helpful to me. But it kind of ties into that piece of sometimes you need to work on your own emotional regulation, your own anger management in order to parent the way that you want to parent and be a respectful, mm -hmm. kind, and nonviolent parent. Mm -hmm. I also think it makes sense to share a couple more resources. A few books that have been really helpful to me are there's a book called Boundaries, and that is really 
helpful to anyone who needs help with boundaries in their life, but there's also Boundaries with Kids. That's an audiobook that I would highly recommend to pretty much anybody. Helps you to figure out how to actually set honest, true, consistent boundaries with your children, which is so important. How many times do you hear an adult say, oh, like I never learned how to manage my spending because my parents didn't model that for me or because my parents didn't expect that of me. Same goes Mm -hmm. for food. Same goes for, you know, all of the things we struggle with as adults. Oftentimes we didn't necessarily see those boundaries be set Mm -hmm. by our parents and they weren't expected of us. So learning how to set boundaries as an adult, super, super, and super helpful in the parenting realm. There's also so many workshops you can look into. And then also, I think if you're trying some strategies, so when I was working through this and it's a daily thing that I'm always working through with this particular child in our family. But I started to try some workshops. I tried to do some reading. I tried to do some podcasts. And even with my background knowledge as a school psychologist who's literally trained to work with kids like this, I still was struggling so much. And that's when I realized I truly needed to step outside of the realm of normal, um, just like normal resources you can access in order to best support the situation. So in those situations, you can reach out to schools, you can reach out to teachers, you can re- reach out to local agencies. Um, Keystone AEA is the place where I used to work. And someone will literally, depending on where you're at, come to your home, help you figure out if the situation you're dealing with is it within the realm of normal or if it's outside of the realm of normal, mm, uh, which leads me to my next point. And my next piece of advice is one piece of information and advice that I always live by is that there is almost always a simple solution to every problem that applies to breastfeeding. It applies to parenting. It applies to so many different things. But what if you could have invited someone into your home who gave you a suggestion after one meeting that literally made every morning better for the rest of the school year? Like that would be worth it. And the negative consequences of that are almost none. Um, I know that there are times where it's really, really hard to reach out for help. There's like when you are looking at some of this paperwork with these local agencies, you might be in a situation where your child is now considered to have a disability, a disability and emotional challenges. But sometimes going down that route is worth it because of the resources that you can access in order to best support your child and to support everyone's well-being in the household because these challenges don't necessarily just impact you and the child or both parents and the child they impact the whole family the whole dynamic and the whole emotional well-being of everyone in the home and yeah. beyond the home too yeah what do you recommend if there is some type of diagnosis or some type of label put on that do you recommend keeping that between parents and just kind of treating the symptoms and implementing the strategies as to not put that child in a box or things like that. I mean, like, I guess, I mean, would you tell the child or would you just use the tools and strategies to help them? We try to parent with honesty as much as possible. So um, that doesn't necessarily apply to our situation in our home, but it definitely applies or with this child that I've been talking about throughout this podcast, but it definitely applies to our daughter, Evie, who will probably have challenges and labels and diagnoses potentially all of her life. I don't know for sure, Mm -hmm. but we will always be so open and honest with her Mm -hmm. about all of these things as much Mm -hmm. as is age appropriate, um, because then she can take that information and she can learn about it herself and she can find things that work Mm -hmm. for her. One really, really great piece of advice that I found on TikTok one day was like, if you're struggling to get going in the morning and you like having a really hard time starting your work for the day, put Mm -hmm. your shoes on because it sends a signal to your brain that you're going, it's time to go. It's time to move. Like even if you're not going to leave the house and that piece of advice changed my life. It helped me so much in in terms of like procrastination. There are so many little tips like that, that we can find Mm -hmm. ourselves, that our kids can find themselves. Uh, Oftentimes if you are talking to another person, even if they're a child, if you ask them what they think would help, they are intuitive. They often have an answer also. So, Mm -hmm. you know, keeping those conversations open, being honest. And uh, I think that's all good. Yeah. 
but also yeah, I think appropriate. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, that was my my process is if you you know you have a kid who maybe has like BDD or like behavioral defiance disorder or something like that. If you tell them, hey, they they think you have this, does that then further root them in and be like, well, I'm not doing it because you know I am defiant. You know, does it label them and make them lean into that more? And I think that's where that age appropriate thing comes in and maybe framing it in a way that is helpful and not. Um, pigeonholing them and saying this is who you are now and this is who you will always be you know right exactly I think another thing that comes to mind when you talk about um asking the child I think something that's been really helpful for me even with Teddy as young as he is is when he is struggling to go to bed to take a bath to transition in any way asking him what can I do to help you what can I do to help this make this easier for you and usually then I give him you know two options do you want me to carry you or do you want to walk like what would make this easier? Do you want mommy to do bedtime or daddy to do bedtime? Like what? And then it gives him a little more power in that situation. I know that that two question thing is absolutely like, amazing. It's, it's amazing. And I, that's the, I think the biggest thing to come out of the parenting, parenting world on social media over the last couple of years is like, give him two choices. And now it's like automatically do that. But asking him what he needs, he usually has an answer. And it like, why? Like just, I see this feels hard for you right now. Can you tell me what feels hard? What can I do to make this easier for you? And he's only two and a half and he can tell me. Um, so giving them that power, I think can be really helpful too. Yeah. And um, that's a conversation I've probably had about a million times over the years in terms of if I give them choices, then I gave them the power and then I no longer have control of the situation mm. as an adult, which is actually not logical thinking because if you are providing the choices you are the person in power you are mm -hmm. the person controlling and managing the situation that is why it's an effective behavior modification tool and method yes yes yeah. and it's are you saying like parents felt that way like if i give them a choice and i'm out of power I'm not gonna say who but, <laughs> but um, i i i feel i feel that but i totally agree with you and i think what also is incredible about that is that you can then lean back on the that wasn't a choice when another yep. choice is brought up of do you want you want to I'm not going well that wasn't a choice you're gonna we can carry and then that's it, it, it's just reiterating that I'm gonna say I want to go back and add this in when you were talking about um them as a toddler what what are some of like the the early signs like a spirited child or like what are some of the things that you started to notice early on yeah, some things that I started to notice early on were that her reactions were a lot more extreme than I expected. Interesting. Would you, um, would your kids who have a hard time with like rule following or um, like being like, I know the rules, but I'm going to do something else because I have, I want to like test the limits. I would, yeah, yes. why, well, that's not a situation that we deal with a lot. Our child actually really loves rules and loves boundaries. So as long as those are communicated to her, mm -hmm. we're in a good spot for the most part. Okay. Um, but yes, that would definitely be um, a child. And so that's kind of what I was trying to get at with talking about, you know, has the environment been set up for the child's personality, mm -hmm. for the, the way that child operates? Because if you have a child who needs closeness to sleep, mm -hmm. Yeah. They're not going to respond very well to being put in their own bed night after night after night. And if they are truly a spirited child, they're mm -hmm. not going to give up on trying to get what they need. And yeah. so kind of one thing that has always driven my professional practice, but also my, uh, my parenting well, is that a child will not, a child doesn't like to engage in a negative or extreme or challenging behavior. They are doing it because they have an unmet need emotionally, mm. physically, or, you know, some other, some other non Maslow's hierarchy. So mm -hmm. oftentimes we have to think about what is the unmet need here? What are they truly seeking? What do they really need in order to function in this situation? And for our particular child who has those extreme reactions in situations where they're not necessarily warranted to yeah. anybody else who's, who would be in that situation, we realized a simple chart on the fridge in the morning that tells us the steps of how we're going to work through our morning 
that she could go and reference over and over and over again all morning long was mm. the thing that solved that problem for us. She had a need for structure that I mm. didn't recognize. Yeah. Interesting. I, I can I get my, I've noticed that with Teddy when I am not as attentive as I normally am on days like yesterday, I see more acting out. I see more defiance because I am not giving him what he needs, which is me. And I know that that's not always realistic, but when I can, I need to, and I could have. And so, yeah, it's, I think that's a really powerful statement. And I think that's another thing that social media says a lot is like, they're not giving me a hard time. They're having a hard time. And there's something that they need in order to like get past this. Like I, I really feel like it's very, very rare for kids to give you a hard time for the sake of giving you a hard time. Like mm -hmm. they're giving you a hard time to get your attention. They're giving you a hard time to get what they want. They're giving like, it's not just to be vindictive. I think there are mm -hmm. cases of that, but they're very rare and they're like, you know. Uh, and also from what I've seen, those situations come up when a child has been labeled a certain way. Mm. This child is manipulative and mm -hmm. their parents have been saying that to them or or within of them yes. their yeah. whole life. They take yes. it on as part of their identity, just yes. like any of us would. If somebody called yes. us something, we are very, very careful with Liz in our home. And, yes. you know, we never call our children naughty. We never call them bad. We never, they are a person. They mm -hmm. are the label of their name. And mm -hmm. other than that, like they are just a, a human floating through this world, trying to do the best they can with the resources that they've been given. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Even the smallest things when someone be like, oh, are you shy to Teddy? I'm like, it's okay to feel shy right now. Like it's, it, he is not shy. He is feeling shy right now because he doesn't know you. <laughs> but exactly. also I, that is a huge thing. And I heard this when I was like 21, I heard someone say what you call them, they become. And mm. it has stuck with me forever because I have friends, I have family and like, this is their choice, but like they'll call their kids like little monsters or little S words. And like, just jokingly, but I'm like, you are Paving think about any time, time in your life someone has said to you like you are this that doesn't brush off mm -hmm. even as an adult if someone was like you're annoying or you like because I mean those are things parents say about their kids and like it's I understand it's you're annoying you're annoying that of me it happens but like <laughs> when if someone were to say to you like you're you are so frustrating you are so annoying you are so man manipulative if they, someone told you that today as a 30 something person you're gonna carry that be like, am I? Is that him? Okay. Like, it doesn't brush off. One thing I like to think about too is that children are the most vulnerable people in our population. So we need to think about how we are supporting them the very best that we can because, I mean, they just ended up here by happenstance. Like, they didn't necessarily ask to be here. They are truly just trying to do the best that they can with, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. what they've been given. So. Yeah. It's, and it's okay it's, as, it's as a parent much. if you have a hard time with that, you know, it's yeah. okay if, as a parent, if you have a hard time with behaviors. And like, I think this is such an interesting podcast because of your background, because you have the tools and you had all this information and that it was still hard for you. Mm -hmm. as a, it is, it doesn't, it, when it's your own, it's a lot different. And when you are so emotionally invested and it's every day and it's all the time, it is not as simple as, you know, just implementing those strategies and being like, oh, okay, whatever. It's like, it, it's so different. So I think that it, anybody listening to this who is dealing with any type of parenting struggle, like this is a great example of like everybody, everybody does and has to work on it and everybody has to implement strategies and work on themselves to overcome those things or to at least handle them in a better way. And so thank you so much for sharing your story. I think that's really, really important. Yeah. Just, yeah, as we kind of wrap this up, it's important to think about, too, a lot of the times the ways that we're triggered and the reasons that we're triggered are things that go way, way back for us. Um, mm -hmm. They are respond there that parents responded to us. They are, you know, that child is pushing a button for you for a reason. And that is why therapy has been so helpful, implementing different kinds of tools, reading books, listening to podcasts, seeking out information, seeking out resources makes a huge difference because sometimes you don't necessarily recognize on a surface level why you are responding the way that you're responding. Mm -hmm. You truly have to step back and you have to be like, okay, like 
what is this? What is coming up for me? Why does this feel so intense? Why does, why do I like a red ball of fire when my kid doesn't want to put their shoes on? Like literally, this is such a small situation in the grand scheme of things. Like pick up the shoes. You can't problem solve necessarily as a parent, no matter how much training and background you have. You truly have to have tools you can reach to, just like you said. We put our mm -hmm. shoes on or we carry them to the car. Those are your right. choices right now. And yeah. and all of the little tips and all of those things are what are the only thing that can make a difference in some of those situations. Yeah. Because we the busy, crazy system that we live in where we're always going, we can't always be like, okay, we're just going to wait it out, which I think waiting it out is a beautiful, amazing tool. is something right. we use all the time. But there are times when it's like, no, like I have a meeting, I have to be somewhere and mm -hmm. we either pick up our shoes or we put them on. <laughs> yeah. I just did a, I could link it in the show notes. I did a YouTube video on mom rage and a research on incidents that cause mom rage for moms. Like they, they surveyed 65 women and said like, what led to an episode of mom rage for you? And one of the top ones was time bound tasks. Like we have mm -hmm. to go and there is no time to wait this out. Um, I, there's no time for me to pull my strategies, but I, I totally agree that that uh, looking into yourself is a big thing. And um, I think understanding that every kid is different and what we're talking about today might not be the tool that works for you, but tailoring that tool um, to that child can be really helpful. And I, I want to reiterate what you said earlier that getting an external opinion can be, and this is from the edu with the educator hat on with, with being a teacher, getting the external help can be life-changing even if it is that one hour consultation even if that is seeing your school psychologist it because you are not equipped to deal with all of this you were not meant to deal with all of this you you have the to do it with the support to do it <laughs> we are islands as moms these days we were not meant to be islands we were meant to have support we were meant to have guidance we were meant to have people holding us up working us through these things we don't have that so we need to seek that when we when it's necessary, unfortunately. Um, and I've seen a lot of wonderful things happen when parents have people like yourself and um, other support staff come in. And um, so don't be ashamed to do that. You, like you're you you weren't meant to do this alone. Yeah, definitely. There's so many little tips and tricks out there that can be so helpful, and it's it's worth looking at them, and it's worth also finding a resource that you align with mm -hmm. and getting suggestions that you align with based on those values you mentioned earlier, because you might get a, a suggestion from the first person you connect with and you're like, mm, like, I don't think I could ever do that. Then you, yeah. then you can out additional resources. You know, you're mm -hmm. not just like, oh, there's no solution to this problem. This is never going to get better. We're going to be yeah. dealing with this forever. No, mm -hmm. no, there, there's yeah. so many people to talk to. There's so many different pieces of advice out there and you just keep you keep researching until you figure out the thing yeah. that works for you and your child and your family. Yeah. And you know, your child and you know, yeah. like what's that gut feeling when you're like, I don't think this is for this, this child, maybe it's not, yep. um, but they're, they're, they're other avenues. So, um, if you're dealing with something like this and you're, um, I, I think, uh, maybe at the end here, we're talking about more extreme cases, but still, even just having your buttons pushed, even just feeling like, you know, I, I think expectations aren't meeting reality for you, like where you envision motherhood as one thing. And now you're responding in a way that you never thought you would. And you're being pushed in ways you'd never thought you would. If you're dealing with that, like know that we see you and we're here for you. And um, we, you know, you can get through it and we're here if you need anything. And if you want any of those resources we talked about, we will list them down in the show notes for sure. If you want more specific resources, if you're like, hey, I do think I want to see somebody about this, we'll put our email down there and we can help you in any way that we can. But um, yeah, I hope that this was uh, supportive for you. And I'm really grateful that you brought this idea to the table at me. Yeah, I think it's just something that so many people deal with. And it can be really, really hard to nap the situation when we're so in our head about it. We're so, you know, we don't have a, a, like you mentioned, a grandparent in the home giving mm -hmm. us a break when it's pretty clear that we need one, you know? Yeah. Things are, yeah. things tricky fast. Yeah. Well, it is, when we release this podcast, it's going to be almost December. It's the first day of November today. It's Emmy's birthday month. Woo Yay. Yes. And so many exciting podcasts coming out this month. Um, yeah. And one thing I wanted to say too, 
I was thinking this morning, what should we do for like the holidays for the Christmas, mm. like the week of Christmas? If anybody has some ideas of things you'd like to hear that week, drop us an email, drop us a comment, let us know, send us a message. Thank you guys so much for being here. As we said at the beginning of the podcast, we are in love with this. So thank you so much for listening. We would love for you to leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and Spotify or write a review. We are also on YouTube now. So if you want to watch the podcast, you can find us over there. Everything will be linked in the show notes. And as always, thank you for being here. We will see you next time. Bye. Yeah.